Hello everyone, my name is Wendy Royal and I'm uh, one of the organizers of the South African Film Festival, which is the annual fundraiser for Education Without Borders. We're really honored uh, today um, to be able to co-present the film Influence uh, with the KDOCS Film Festival, which is Metro Vancouver's premier social justice film festival. And joining me today are Diana Neal and Richard Poplack, co-directors of uh, the film Influence, which uh, you've all just seen. So welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. We're really delighted to have this chance to explore your film further. So there's so thank much- you. Thanks to for having us. Great, thank you again. Uh, there's so much to uh, unpack in your, in your film, so I'm just going to jump right in. Um, I think the first thing is that we're all very aware of uh, the Russian influence in the 2016 elections and uh, fake news and uh, misinformation. We've been inundated with that over the last few years. So your film was actually very timely. But I'd like you to, first of all, take us back to the beginning and what motivated you to tell the Bill, uh, the Bell Pottinger story. Uh, Diana, would you like to start? Sure, Wendy, I think, sure, no problem. Uh, it was around May 2017 that the editor of Daily Maverick, which is the publication that we work with, uh, was handed a tranche of, of leaked emails, uh, which have become known as the Gupta leaks. Uh, a huge amount, I think about 200,000 emails um, that really detailed the extent of the state capture project, as we call it here in South Africa, essentially private um, interests involved in state activities, um, hollowing out the state uh, through corrupt means. And I think it, it was a real answer to, to the sense of kind of political turmoil that was going on and had been going on under the regime of Jacob Zuma, our, our president at the time. Um, and in the middle of that leaks was Bell Pottinger and the role that they had played. There had been a, a document that had leaked earlier that had kind of given a sense that they were involved somehow in the South African body politic. But the, the leaks certainly showed the extent to which they were involved and was a, a shocking indictment on, on the company and, and, and our politics here in South Africa as well. Um, but I think, you know, I approached Richard and said, would he work on a film with me? Because I felt that there was really a lot more to the story. And uh, we were subsequently proved uh, right about that. It was quite quite the journey to go on. Amazing, yeah. Did you want to add anything, Richard, or, or that captures? No, I, I, I just think I just think you, you know so much powerful um, information can be derived from um, really really well investigated data journalism, and I mean that's exactly what the Gupta leaks were. Was this? huge tranche of, uh, of data that it was our task to kind of sift through. Right. Um, and along with, uh, I think, another 17 or so colleagues, I think we did quite a good job of um, figuring out, of being able to piece together the mechanisms mm -hmm. of state capture. Um, and what was so interesting about it 
and I think this is what makes the Gupta Leagues a truly international story, is that state capture in South Africa wasn't about the African National Congress stealing from the South African people. It was about government colluding with blue chip multinationals like KPMG, like McKinsey, like Lieber, like SAP, um, companies from you know, the developed world who ostensibly should know better, who were contributing to this, this massive project of theft. And one of those companies was Bell Pottinger. And we felt very strongly um, and were very angry about their participation in this, uh, in this mechanism. Incidentally, EDC, uh, Economic Development Canada, was also involved in uh, the Gupta scandal, which is uh, something for your Canadian viewers just uh, yeah. interesting to Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah I, 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 yeah, a, a reminder that 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 there are uh, a number, Bombardier being being primary among them. Yeah. Right. A number of Canadian organizations and uh, uh, government agencies, and also heavily state subsidized corporations, involved in international corruption in a way that is insidious um, and unacceptable. Yes, absolutely. And but this had been going on for decades. I mean, Tim Bell and Bell Pottinger had been interfering with the democratic processes in many countries previously. Uh, one only has to look at his involvement and the company's involvement in Margaret Thatcher's Britain, in uh, Pinochet's Chile, uh, the US in Iraq, um, Assad, Syria. So what do you think it was about the South African situation that made people say enough's enough and actually stand up and resist and bring about the downfall, finally, of the company? Yeah, I, I, think, I, I think the answer to that question, if I, if I may, is that uh, the, the campaign that they waged was so obviously disgusting. I mean, what they decided to do, you know, effectively what Bell Pottinger had, do, had been doing since its inception in, in the late 90s was to exploit the divisions within societies in order to gain an electoral uh, advantage. Right. Uh, or, or to or, or to benefit one of their uh, uh, their clients, what they did they did in South Africa was come in, look around, and say, you know what, the obvious fault line in South Africa is race. Mm -hmm. Let's exploit that for the uh, for the Z the Zuma family and the family of his uh, of his backers, the Guptas. Let's set a fire under this long simmering national wound, and just dive in and keep stabbing. Um, and that's exactly what they did. So I think it was so obviously disgusting. It right. was so disgracefully cynical that um, Bell Pottinger's critics piled on and even its friends had no choice but right. to expel it from various boards, expel it from various um, uh, commissions and agencies and, and effectively uh, end the company's very, very successful and very, very lucrative run yeah. as one of the world's primary public relations firms. Yeah, I do think, Wendy, that there was another, there were a few other aspects, I, I won't go into all of them, but, but a big one was really kind of a remarkable thing, and I think a lot of people have recognized that, that, that it was this moment in South African history um, when a lot of players kind of just, just kind of, you know, got involved, um, which you don't really see anymore, which which was, you know, the, the private sector to a large extent, the clients of Bell Potter just saying, you know what, this is a this is a bridge too far. We're out, yeah. you know, among them, you know, to give him that credit, uh, Johan Rupert and, and and the likes who had been with Bell Potter for decades. Right. Um, but then also more importantly, you know, investigative journalists kind of piling on and saying, you know, this is what's going on. This is the extent of it. Um, opposition politics, which at the time was was quite robust, sadly has has now declined um, considerably. Mm. But at the time, you know, the DA. Um, for all the controversy, was was a very was very good at holding certain um, parts of government to account. And Pumzile Van Dam, who's a, a big character in the film, was was right. dogged about going after Bell Pottinger yeah. in her role as Shadow Communications Minister, and had a massive, you know, a, a, a formative effect uh, in, yeah. in making sure that they were brought to, to some kind of yeah. justice. And then, of course, you had your civil society groups and society at large then saying, you know what, this this is worth, you know, this is worth our time, and and we will no longer allow these you know people from you know entities from from abroad coming in and, and manipulating us and it was this incredible kind of groundswell yeah and i think yeah. it's worth you know pointing it out and saying that that was such an amazing moment to be a south african um, and you know certainly amazing to witness as well yeah amazing and and to go from there so yes uh bell pottinger was ex expelled from the professional body uh the organization eventually collapsed and went bankrupt but 
all those millions of dollars that were went into the hands of Tim Bell and his company, uh, into Guptas and, and uh, Zuma and all the cronies, uh, that should have been going into uplifting South Africa, into hospitals and education, etc. Et Where is that money now? That that money has disappeared. And Switzerland. you can well, well, no, no. The, 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 uh, if, the, there have happens. been some very aggressive. Um, uh, sorry to cut you off, Wendy. Yeah. Wendy, it's it's a brilliant question. It's a brilliant question because there have been some really aggressive and really innovative. Um, mechanisms employed in, in order to try and get some of that money back. Right. So um, there, there is a mechanism by which um, a consortium of South African journalists and others are suing the insurance company okay. um, for, uh, for, for some of those funds. There is a huge clawback of money that was paid out, lots of money that was paid out to Bell Pottinger partners mm -hmm. uh, from very, very junior partners who would have had nothing to do with that particular... Um, with that particular job or, or campaign, all the way up to the senior partners who are being punitively smashed um, uh, for, uh, for their involvement in that campaign. So there has been some attempt to claw back. And I think one of the things that kind of encourages Diana and, and, and myself is that there are these legal formulations now being used within the social justice um, environment by which to hold corporations accountable financially for their misdeeds. That's the only thing that matters, right? Right? Yeah. Is you know, finding them um, is is you know, finding the larger a corporation when you're finding a bank or when you find Goldman Sachs or whomever. What does that do? That hits the shareholders, right? What we need to start doing. As, uh, as, uh, as, uh, as uh, first of all, as journalists by holding people to account, but then as activists, it's starting to get very real about how to hit bad guys in their pocketbooks, their personal pocketbooks. Mm -hmm. And it's all about damaging the personal wealth of, uh, of, um, of bad actors like the guys in Bell Pottinger, and that's exactly what's been happening. Mm -hmm. It's one thing to, to find the company. That's yeah. the shareholder's problem. It's another thing to find into individual actors, and that's what's been happening. Don't forget also there's been an incredible initiative from the American financier Bill Browder um, in the Magnitsky Act. It's quite complex, so I won't go into it now because I'm just aware of time. But essentially it's you know legislation that's been passed in countries around the world to essentially sanction um, known corrupt businessmen from working uh, with state entities and, and private entities uh, in the United States and is actually an, probably the, the, the worst punishment that the Guptas have had because they have been sanctioned and, and mm. their partners have been sanctioned un, under that act, right. um, which, which essentially means that they, they, it's very difficult for them to operate within the international um, mm. ecosystem without you know, ma major scrutiny or you know, if at all. So that was, a, right. I think, a big win, even though they haven't been prosecuted right. here in South Africa. Right. And as you, you mentioned, this goes beyond uh, Bell Pottinger and, and their company. It, it involves corporations, multinationals throughout the world, including Canada. Are they going to be held account accountable? Uh, what what uh, avenues uh, are there to make those big companies accountable? I'm, you know, I've got to be honest with you, Wendy. One of the disappointing things over the, over the course of the past couple of years has been speaking to smart Canadians about uh, the term corruption. You know, our day job is dealing with corruption. I'm not entirely sure how uh, savvy Canadian journalists, and I say that with, uh, with, with all due respect, and certainly Canadian policymakers are, I'm not sure they understand the term, you know, um, the, 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 the liberal administrations uh, under, under Trudeau have done very little to hold uh, big companies like Bombardier um, and, and others who get funding from Canadian agencies like the EDC. I'm not sure how good a job they've, they've done at holding these big agencies and these big corporations that are heavily subsidized to account. Um, the Bombardier story, is, is mind boggling how disgraceful and how corrupt that company is um, in almost every, every sphere of, of its business. Uh, and they've been allowed to get, a, get away with this under conservative governments, under liberal, liberal governments, under about five or six different prime ministers. Um, so 
I'm not entirely sure how sharp in the mind of Canadians um, corporate corruption and government corruption necessarily is. Mm -hmm. And that has trickle down effects in the rest of the world. And it has had material impact on, uh, on, on taxpayers funding here in South Africa. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. No, ca carry on, uh, Diana. Were you going to add something? Say, you know, I think I was, yeah. And I think, you know, what, what was so exciting about, or important at least uh, in our minds about telling the story was to, even though it's tangential to Margaret Thatcher, um, you know, to be able to show the, the major effect that she's had on, on the world economy um, since her tenure, um, with the help of a, a guy like Lord, Lord Bell um, in, in driving the, neo, the, the neoliberal agenda. Uh, you know, and I think until, until you know, corporations and multinationals um, are kind of forced to understand that make, you know, making shareholder value your sole priority, right. um, it's, it will be very difficult to hold companies to account and, and ensure that, that this type of uh, action doesn't happen again. Right. Uh, because the value system that, that kind of governs this is, is completely you know it's it's completely skewed and it makes it very very difficult um to ensure that there's transparency first of all right. uh, which makes our jobs easier and and the role of citizens and understanding who these these role players are mm -hmm. um and it just makes it very difficult to to, to keep these these companies honest so i think you know right. we, we need to understand how the system works um right. and what the major failings of it are at the moment well i think it also speaks to the importance of films like yours in getting the message out and uh, for, for film festivals like uh, KDOC's uh, Social Justice Film F Festival to, to inform citizens, to inform Canadian journalists uh, about what is happening and the implications it has for Canadian companies as well. It's not just something that happened in South Africa, it's, it's involved uh, throughout the world. Um, but just to go back a little bit, so so I'm I'm really uh, glad it, it's it's uh, great to hear that those monies are being f uh, followed up. Um, but I also would like to you to to um, comment perhaps on what has been the effect on South Africa of the impact of uh, those years of sowing racial divisions and hatred. How has South Africa recovered from that? If they have, you, well, you're asking you're asking a very big question, and that is, how do you gauge the effect of the weapons that companies like Bell Pottinger deployed in the various places in which they worked? Mm -hmm. And the answer, Wendy, is that there, there was ve it's very difficult to measure um, the damage that these weapons uh, that these weapons um, deliver. So here in South Africa, we still use the language that Bell Pottinger resurrected from the grave of the fight against apartheid. A white monopoly capital is still, uh, still being employed. Um, all of the racial terminology that, that had fled up when, uh, when uh, Bell Pottinger re-injected into, into the Bali politic, right. still employed, radical economic transformation. They did an enormous service to the faction that is still very, very, very viable within the ANC um, and, and is still nominally loyal to Zuma um, or to Zuma's faction. So none of that stuff has gone away. Um, you can't put the genie back in the bottle. And that is what is so dangerous about the kind of work that a company like Bell Pottinger has done all over the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, uh, Zuma is uh, standing uh, trial for on corruption charges at the moment, right? Um, no, not quite. Not quite. They're trying yeah. to get okay. him into court, but he's, yeah, yeah. Okay. He has yeah, but but he okay. will be. You're right in that yeah, he will he be going charged. to he will okay. be going to court on the original corruption and, and fraud charges dating back to the mid zeros. Yes. Okay. What are your feelings about getting a conviction? Um, yeah, I, I think I think the chances are good. Uh, look, he's been using very successfully over the past 15 years, sort of Stalingrad, um, raise the ground behind and in front of him legal tactics. Um, he has uh, his his legal costs are paid for by the government effectively. So he has an unlimited use of 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 legal tactics. Uh, and that allows him to use a Stalingrad uh, legal uh, legal strategy. So you you know he can he, he can avoid court he can avoid court and he can avoid court whether 
whether he uh, is convicted uh, while he's alive <laughs> or whether it's posthumous, uh, there will be a conviction, uh, at least on a number of those, those charges. But again, just as important, who is in the stand alongside him? Mm-hmm. That's Tal's. The, the, uh, the French defense or rather weapons company. Um, so th- th- again, another major multinational is sitting in the dock alongside him. And to me uh, and to Diana, it's just as important for Tals to get a, a conviction as well um, uh, as Jacob Zuma. So it's, it will be great to see him in orange overalls, but it's also important that there's a wider net that is cast and all of the baddies um, get their day. Just a bit of context on that for your viewers who might not be aware of what, what Richard's talking about. So Tyler's and uh, Tyler's was involved in this case with Zuma because he was involved in a major arms deal scandal uh, from kind of early on in our democracy. And th- those are the first charges that he's up against. Then there are a raft of other charges over the two decades since then that, you know, mm-hmm. corruption, racketeering, that, that kind of thing as well, which will come up later once they've hopefully gotten through mm-hmm. the earlier ones. But these are, these are Zuma's original sins. And they're effectively the original sins of of South African democracy. Um, And and so, you you know, I do think there's a chance at some point the net is going to close and uh, there'll be convictions. What what happens after that is anyone's guess. Mm -hmm. Um, There are huge political movements that are that are in play trying to ensure that um, corrupt members of the ANC do not do any jail time. It's it's going to be really tense. And really, really explosive. Right. And in terms of the Guptas, are, are they likely to be charged or have they fled the country? Where are they now? There is a uh, extradition treaty with Dubai that has been ratified but not signed. Mm-hmm. So uh, due to the fact, uh, the last we, we heard of it, yeah. uh, there was an issue with Dubai being able to translate the, uh, the, the legal documents from the South Africa. African side into Arabic, um, whether or not they found a translator who can uh, translate from Arabic, from English into Arabic somewhere in the UAE, we're not quite sure yet. Um, But at this stage, um, the the extradition treaty remains in limbo. Um, And so many, many, many African criminals flee to the UAE and find free passage there. Um, and are able to spend their stolen wealth there. And that remains true of the Guptas. We really, really hope that very soon that changes. Yes, for sure. Um, I'm going to move beyond uh, South Africa now, uh, because I think your film also had a, a chilling warning, really, about how easily democratic processes and people's beliefs and behaviors can be changed, used, controlled and manipulated uh, in this technological era. But what can we as as individuals, what can we do to protect ourselves? What can we do to be alert to bad influence and misinformation? Do you have any suggestions? It's a question. Oh, I think you've frozen. It's a question Sorry. I get a lot, Wendy, and I, you know, I think uh, we always, we always say, well, we're just the journalists, we just tell the story. Um, but, you know, I, I think it's a good question. And it's something that obviously we, you know, we're all affected by, uh, which is this, the sense that our communication channels and, and our, the platforms with which we engage every single day, hours on end, um, are, are very, very tricky to navigate. And that, you know, there's a sense of chaos and a sense of overwhelm, right? Um, which is all, you know, very intentional when it comes to disinformation. The primary purpose of disinformation is to is to sow chaos which in turn sows fear which in turn makes in turn makes people easier to manipulate because those are the the emotions that we feel um that are that are the easiest to to kind of play with uh, and to use against us and it all sounds very conspiratorial but but this is something that i think has become very clear over the last few years since we actually decided to make influence at the time it was still very much you know kind of we were still trying to figure out what was going on and i think now four years later we have the benefit of a lot of, of people working in the space, trying to understand these forces, who's behind them, where are they proliferating, um, where do they come from, and, and what is their aim? Um, and I think it's certainly been proven time and again that, that chaos is the, is the main objective. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think in terms of how to, to protect ourselves from that, 
you know, there's a number of different things, but we always say, you know, practice information hygiene, you know, just as you would during COVID use hand sanitizer, uh, you know, just be very careful about how often, how much information you're ingesting. I mean, you know, 40 years ago, we didn't, we didn't get bombarded with news 24 hours a day. Um, you know, talk news or, or 24 hour news has been so divisive and so, I think, so damaging to both journalism and to society. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just because it promotes the sense that, you know, you always need to, to have someone talking to you analy analytically um, about what's going on. Uh, and we don't need to be plugged into the news cycle 24 hours a day. So I think it, it's, it's really about um, choosing your news sources discerningly, trying to, you know, limit the time spent on social media. Those platforms have just become, in my opinion, I have to say, so toxic. Um, and, you know, those, I think those companies are also liable for so much of, of the problems that we face in this regard now. Mm -hmm. um, and really just, just be very aware of who is behind the messaging that, the messaging that you're consuming. Um, and that way you'll understand better what their motivations might be. Um, and, I, you know, I think it's okay to limit the amount of information that we take in on a daily basis. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, another thing, legislation and regulation is supposed to be in the public good. So when we give free passage to companies like Alphabet, like Facebook, like Twitter, we really have to ask ourselves, is that in the public good? In the context of a social justice film festival, um, I think those are very, very important questions. Uh, information, clean, hygienic information is a human right. It is. Um, you know, this is something we've said at, at, at a number of, of human rights festivals. Um, how, you, how you guarantee that right is one of the questions, one of the fundamental questions of the information age, of the digital revolution. How we answer that question, how honestly we answer it, um, is, is one of the fundamental questions of, of this revolution. And it is a revolution that we're all, that we're all trying to find our way through. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Yeah, that, I think that, that is very good advice and, and fantastic for our audience to hear because I think it, it does instill a little bit of fear in all of us when we see films like yours um, about how easy it is for us to be influenced. Anyway, we have unfortunately run out of time. It's been fantastic talking to you and learning more ab about uh, the, the film. Um, but Likewise, I have, likewise. Mm. Uh, I have one last question. Uh, question to ask and and that is if there is a single message you'd like the audience to take from your film what would it be stay awake yeah be vigilant yeah stay democracy away. democracy is a process by which everyday involvement is necessary you yeah. know the, the elections are like are, are like breathing uh, that that's something we have to do. We, we have to we have to get through it. It's 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 a but that isn't the fundamental of the democracy. The fundamentals of democracy are everyday engagement um, in your uh, in, in your own life, in your family's life, in your community's life, in your national life. Um, and and I think that is what the film is trying to say. Be awake. Great, that's fantastic, uh, Diana. Can you add to that, or is that your message too? I don't know if I can. I'm afraid we've yeah, uh, seen to be hope to tell. You know, we, we shook hands on the message. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, that's great. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's been a pleasure talking to you both. Thank you for your time. Um, I, I think uh, the audience will have learned a lot from this. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye, Richard. We appreciate your time. Thank Wendy, you. thank you. Thank you. Thanks to the audience. Thank you. Bye bye.